Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Sports Lovers Podcast. I'm your host, Brock Murchie. With me, as always, is my incredibly talented co-host, Hunter Nisley. Hunter, how are you doing? Oh, Mr. Brock, thank you so much for having me once again. I'm always happy to be here. I'm doing really well, sir. How are you? How are you doing, Mr. Brock? Hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm really excited for this podcast we got lined up today. We're going to be covering a, uh, a rough variety of topics. We're going to be talking at the very start specifically some Penn State basketball. We're, then we're going to go into the NCAA tournament as a whole, some of our favorite games, some of our favorite moments, what are our predictions going forward. And then we're going to be talking a little bit of the World Baseball Classic. And without any ado, we will jump right into Penn State basketball, who made the tournament this year. Uh, This is the first time they've made the tournament since 2011, when they lost to Temple. This is the first time they've won since 2001. So for context, in 2001, I was like three years old. Let's see, nice. Sorry, I was four years old in 2001. So it's, it's been a long time. And, uh... They played Texas A&M. I'll tell you what, Hunter. That was one of the best nights of my life. Mm-hmm. They whooped them, baby. They they whooped them. I was watching the I watched the pregame and the you know the halftime and the postgame. And in the pregame, like, hey, Charles Barkley, I think he's a pretty funny guy, but he was trashing Penn State. He was just, <laughs> you know, big SEC guy. He was saying that the SEC was underrated going into this tournament. He didn't think Penn State and Texas A&M was going to be close. Kenny the Jet Smith was like, yeah, I'm not supposed to root for people, but I really want to see Texas and Texas A&M play because he knows, because he knows what that rivalry means to the state. And so, not much looking good for Penn State in the pregame, and then they just came out swinging. Man, it was like, it was like watching the Warriors. Like they couldn't miss a three; they were just going off. Man, I, it was such a great night. What about you, Nasley? What was that night like for you? Man, it was crazy. It was crazy. Actually, I didn't see the first half because I was on the road. Oh, uh, no. I had I was I got stuck at work late and I had to drive that night. Um, so I listened to it on the radio. I tell you what, AM radio at nighttime, it's a little it's a little sketchy, Brock. Trying to trying to find the station, I was running into <laughs> some weird stations. Oh no! Road. But uh, it was, I mean, it was crazy. I we like you said, we haven't seen Penn State in the tournament since 2011, um, and it was a heartbreaker against Temple at that time. And I feel like pretty much. Everybody was on Texas A&M for for that game. It was or at least before the game. It, it felt like a really tough draw for for Penn State for Penn State fans. Um, and they just came out swinging. They Andrew Funk was essentially Steph a mixture of Steph Curry and Clay Thompson for two hours. Um, and there was just there was just nothing Texas A&M could do to to stop him. And it was it was unbelievable watching it and then watching it back the next day and seeing all the highlights and people, you know, pro- proving Charles Barkley wrong and and everything it was it was a good night now the following six days after that it weren't good yeah. for, for Penn State basketball fans no but we had one we had one night to enjoy and I, I embraced it very much yeah I what happened the the multiple things that happened afterward were not great but I still I still very much cherish that night like I remember watching Penn State basketball like when we were in high school and they could not buy a basket man it was it was painful to watch they had a player Ross Travis uh, sorry Ross Travis who I was convinced was being paid to lose the games on purpose like that's the only explanation for what he did now Ross Travis was a bit of a winner in the end because oddly enough he there's a little known fact is that he went into the NFL draft and was drafted to the Kansas City Chiefs practice squad. And he did catch a pass from Alex Smith in a playoff game. So, not bad for him. But, like, you know, the Taylor Battles and the DJ Newbills and, you know, all that. And just to see a win like that felt really great, honestly. And I guess, to be fair, you you wouldn't exactly hype up Penn State going into the game like that as an analyst. But still, it just felt great seeing them play so well. I do want to get your thoughts on um I think I think Penn State was kind of given a bad deal with their seeding. And I know the commentators brought up and I don't think this is wrong per se, but they're like, "Oh, we you know, we didn't really know what Penn State had." And I I kind of see that, but you know, the Big 10 was close. Like it was a really close race the whole way to the end. And you know, Penn State beats Illinois. 
you know, Penn State beats Illa, uh, Indiana, and Penn State beats Northwestern, you know, all those teams got a better seed than than Penn State did, which I, I thought was a little unfair, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it it was it was tough because there's there's so many different you know different ratings and different rankings. Uh, ranking systems in college basketball because there's there's the net, there's the AP poll, there's the coaches poll, there's the Kempom ranking. Um, it's there there's quad wins now too. There's quad one, two, three, and four games that they play, and it can be very confusing for I think for everybody. Even the people seeding these teams are like, damn, I like, what do we do here? Um, because it was the final AP poll. Um, Penn State wasn't ranked, but they were they were receiving votes, and you can kind of go in order by the teams that are receiving votes. Like the team receiving the most votes is 26, and the next team is 27, and so on. Um, I, if I remember correctly, Penn State was around like 29 or 30 uh, at, at the very end of the regular season, uh, and they were even in that they were ranked ahead of Illinois, and they were ranked ahead of Northwestern. Uh, Northwestern was, was three seats higher than them. In which Northwestern had a good year, but by all means, I don't think they, you know, didn't deserve the the seventh seat that they got. Um, but even a team like Illinois, Illinois had two quad one wins on the entire season. Uh, Penn State had seven, I believe, so they had a lot more quality wins. So I would say they were probably a little underseeded, but at the same time, too, Penn State was five and nine in conference play at one point. And they they were on the outside looking in there for a little while, and then they just reeled off a bunch of wins, and you know got to the Big Ten championship, which is crazy. And they almost came back and beat Purdue. And at the end of the day, they made the postseason. And they Texas A&M was was a you know kind of gypped with their seed. They ended up being a seven, even though they finished like number sixteen in the country in the AP poll, which would line up with about a four seed. And they dropped to a seven, which was interesting. Didn't matter. Penn State took care of business there. Then, of course, lost to Texas, the number two seed in the bracket. But, you know, at the end of the day, Penn State was 500 in conference play. If you want to get a better seed in the tournament, you just you got to win. You got to win more more than half your conference games to do that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And all, like you said, too, with the uh, all these different ranking systems, you can kind of jumble it up. Um, but it is interesting, like, you know, that was Northwestern. That was like, uh, we brought this up before, like that was only like their second time ever in the, you know, tournament. And then they got a win and that was great for them. But it just seemed like, I still stand by, like, I think they could have given Penn State a better shot there. But, uh, but regardless, like you said, they move on to play Texas, the Longhorns. It was a good game. Uh, couldn't quite get it at the end. And they didn't quite have that three magic that they had throughout the previous games. And the only annoying thing to me, I mean, losing is annoying. The only thing I wish they would have fixed in that game was that they, they let the guy who averages eight points a game score over 20 points. And at some point I just, again, it's not easy, but it's like, you know, they weren't shooting great from three or, you know, close to three. So just collapse on that dude in the middle or like down low, like don't let that guy shoot. Um, also, I didn't know for Texas, there's Sir Jabari Russell. I didn't think that was his real name. I thought that was just like a nickname. It's like, no, I was surprised when his name popped up. It says Sir Jabari Russell. It's like, oh, okay, cool for him. Yes, sir. Texas, good good ball team. Uh, of course, uh, Disu is their big guy. And one thing Penn State struggled all season long with was size and depth in their big man. It was pretty much if... It was Keba Jai, who was a fr- true freshman who struggled against uh, at least some, some better big man throughout the year, and he did improve throughout the year. Uh, off the bench, they were bringing, you know, Mikey Hen, six foot seven Mikey Hen, who did what he could, man. I mean, he, he played hard. He tried his best out there defensively. And if it wasn't Mikey Hen, then you had six four Miles Dredd playing center, who honestly probably played their best post defense out of anybody oh, on the team. 100%. Like, I mean, he's a he's a big six four, you know. Like he's he's a he's a, <laughs> yeah. he's a pretty thick man. You can't back him down too easy. It's just too bad his his arms aren't long I'm enough. Pret- to, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to do too much there, but you know, it's crazy. Penn State played pretty terribly most of that game, and they were up three with a couple minutes to go, and then Texas just 
went on a run like like they did for against a lot of teams that year. So certainly no shame in losing to Texas. They uh, were one of the best two seeds, and they went to the the Elite Eight and lost, ended up losing to Miami. So no shame in that. And you know that loss at least looks pretty good for Penn State because they played him close. Yeah, but man, I was sitting there. I was like, dude, like right now, Penn State has a chance to be somewhat of a bracket buster. I was like, man, that's unreal. Like, that's something I don't know if I ever thought I would say or at least think. Like, Penn State could be a bracket buster. But we didn't quite get that. And, you know, we're sitting there. We're like, ah, tough loss, but heck of a season. Things are looking up. And then we were struck with the dagger to the heart. Absolute heartbreaking news. Penn State loses head coach Micah Strewsbury to the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And, uh, yeah, that was a tough... I remember being at work and one of my, you know, coworkers told me that and just being like, man, this isn't real, right? Um, and I just, you know, wanted to get your thoughts on that, Hunter Nisley. Yeah, that was certainly, that's tough because I, you know, Micah Shrewsbury, at least in my opinion, is an excellent coach. He was, you know, arguably the first or second, like most sought after coach this off season. And it's just unfortunate that he, you know, he's from Indiana, a job in Notre Dame opens up, which is in Indiana. And it just, I don't blame the man at all. You know, really, if there's any blame to go around for us as, as to why he wouldn't stick at a place like Penn state. Uh, I think it was inevitable. First of all, that he was going to end up back in Indiana, whether it was going to be at IU, Notre Dame, Purdue, as soon as one of those jobs opened up, he was probably going to take it, like regardless. Um, but there was, there's a lot of, of, there's a lot of flack that Penn State took, and deservedly so, for you know the the lack of NIL funding that that they have right now, and just the lack of NIL ability, especially within their basketball program. Um, their facilities are not particularly great. The Bryce Jordan Center is not the best venue for, for a basketball game. Um, probably the worst in the big 10. And if it's not the worst, it's the next worst. It's gotta be close. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. Um, and just, it's just, I don't, I don't know if it's cause it's not a basketball area. I mean, this central PA is very much dominated by football, by wrestling, even baseball yeah. is really, is really big around here too. So, um, no matter what, I think Micah Shrewsbury is leaving. But it, it's really disappointing, you know, just just as a fan of Penn State to, to have those two years and to see like modern basketball be played in, in State College. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's we're we're so used to just Penn State being like the tough, scrappy team that's going to win 15 games <laughs> and they're going to lose by six to the one of the top two seeds in the Big Ten tournament after winning like a game or a game or two and then uh and then off to the cbi or if it's a good year maybe the nit sometimes but that was uh they kind of caught lightning in a bottle with micah shrewsbury and, and it's very unfortunate that they were not able to to keep him yeah and i was i i i kept you know i didn't get a chance to do like a deep dive of all the details supposedly they matched the offer for micah shrewsbury and maybe like you know, maybe the university was like content, like, like similar to you said, like, okay, we've got pretty, a, a good football program, got a, you know, a great, um, wrestling program. Um, baseball's not great there, but like, you know, we have this great hockey team. We have, you know, Pagula Ice Arena, great venue. Maybe they just didn't care. And, uh, Penn State as of right now is not a, in my opinion, like a sustainable place for success, so to speak, yet yeah, like, like, uh, you know, with like Duke and North Carolina and Kentucky and Kansas, like those programs are going to keep getting good players, you know, and, and maybe even like a, a middle of the road team. I, I can't think of an example right now, but they'll, they'll, they'll do pretty well where with Penn State, like a good chance after a lot of these guys go, we're going to be right back to square one. It's going to be hard to get players to come here. So yeah. I, I guess yeah. like the, the last point I just want to make quick was like, yeah, like I guess being close to home, you know, maybe that was part of it. You know, maybe he's, you know, been a big Notre Dame fan his whole life, but just like 
you know, Notre Dame basketball is not good. They were not good this year, didn't make the tournament, you know, lost in the start to, um, I don't know, I can't remember if it was Wake Forest or Virginia Tech or who it was, but it was somebody. And it just seemed like, is there really going to be that much? Are you really changing? Is the grass even greener on the other side or is it the same lawn, so to speak? So that was kind of, those are my, that was kind of my process for the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is there. There was kind of like a late push, like you said too. They, they, uh, or at least what we're being told is that they match Notre Dame's offer, at least salary wise, uh, to to what they were offering, which was in like the four million or so range uh, per year for his contract. But you know, Penn State made a late push at at trying to just match money into you know for donations and whatnot to try to make him happy. Uh, but that's that's not how you build a program. You don't just scrap it together in, in like 48 hours in hopes that you're going to keep this guy. Like this has to be, you have to show sustained success and you have to show the, the want to do that and the, the ability to do that too. And Penn State's kind of been stuck in the mud for years. They're way behind the eight ball on these on these things. Even, even their football program for a while was really behind the eight ball. Um, even even at the, the end of the Joe Paterno years, when it was just becoming evident, like it's like we kind of have to keep this guy because he's been at Penn State forever and he's been super successful and the community loves him. But at the same time, he's holding back the program at this point. And and you know the Penn State's board of trustees and and whatnot just didn't care and held back the basketball program. They just simply didn't care. There was there was no funding. Even their Penn State's basketball budget is was last in the big 10 you know it may not be now oh wow but but it was last in the big 10 you know and it's a shame that it came to this but it, at, at the end of the day you know no coach is gonna look at it and say at least prior to you know today yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with some other news that came today but um it's it's hard to retain somebody with just no no track record of of anything their their track record was mediocrity to to bad it, it wasn't good right so uh, they really they only have themselves to blame for even getting into the situation yeah well i still think now they were showing on during one of the games that back in like the 50s uh penn state team went to the final four and I guess technically that's the best season for Penn State basketball, but that was like the fifties. That was a completely different time to me. This, I, I, I technically we, I feel like we have to sit down and say like, you know, this was the best year for Penn State basketball. Yeah, this was this was easily the best year, uh, of course, since twenty eleven. Yeah, you know, you might you might be able to argue two thousand one because of them going to the Sweet Sixteen, upsetting North Carolina was a big deal at that time. Um, but I'd say, yeah, it's between this year, or I guess technically last season, uh, and, and 2001 would, would be the, the two standout years, really, for, for any modern-day Penn State fan. Yeah, and with Micah Strewsbury moving on, um, we have Mike Rhodes uh, replacing him. I'm going to be honest, didn't know he existed until he was hired. Uh, I just learned that he apparently coached at VCU. And, uh, Isaac, do you have any information on this guy or is there anything you wanted to add about this guy before we move on? Yeah. I mean, Mike Rhodes coached VCU for, I think six seasons, made the tournament a couple of times with them. Um, you know, his track record at VCU is pretty good just in terms of, of winning there. Um, he hasn't won an NCAA tournament game yet, but you know, that's, that's fair. He, he's at least gotten there, which is more than what Penn state normally can say. Um, you know, he he brings more of a kind of a classic Big Ten basketball style. You know, if you like watching Rutgers basketball, if you like watching Wisconsin basketball, <laughs> I, th- I think that's what we're going to see with Mike Rhodes, which I wouldn't say um, is super excited about. You know, yeah, I, I I certainly enjoyed the season of of modern basketball. Uh running pick and rolls and shooting threes is pretty fun. Yes. And, uh, what, what, uh, Illinois coach Brad Underwood would call booty ball that (laughs) that Jalen Pickett plays, but it was certainly fun. Um, I I guess we'll see a a lot of, 
it, he, he feels like a very safe choice, which at the end of the day, when you've only made two or I guess three NCAA tournaments since 2000, maybe the safe <laughs> choice is the right choice. Of course. So yeah. obviously we can't know until we see my, you know, Mike Rhodes might end up being a, an incredible coach here at Penn state. He's, he's a, from Pennsylvania. Uh, he's done very well recruiting in the PA and the DMV general area. So, you know, it, it's exciting to see uh, what players he's going to bring to Penn state. If he's going to be able to retain any of the, uh, the couple of guys left on the team or any of the guys that have gone into the transfer portal. Um, you know, Hey, Micah Shrewsbury's son is still technically committed to Penn state. He is not decommitted. All yet. right. So technically Braden Shrewsbury is still on the roster for, for next season <laughs> at, at the moment, at least. Okay. This is, this is nine 30 on March 29th. He's still <laughs> technically on the team. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. You never know. You never say never. Never say never. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I, I still sit down and just like, wow, that was really great when Penn State basketball beat Texas A&M. Of course, I just thought of this. There was uh, in 2020 Penn State basketball doing pretty well, but sadly the tournament was canceled due to COVID. We'll never know what, what that team could have accomplished or what happened with that, which is too bad. But I, the I'm end t- of the Patrick Chambers era. End of the Patrick Chambers era as well after his unfortunate comment to – one of his players. Um, yeah, I I just feel like the future right now for Penn State, it was looking pretty good. We were pretty happy, and now we're kind of back to like a, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, and not in a good way. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say the future is bright, generally, compared to like, like the 2012 through 2016 years. It's I think it's much brighter than those years. That's fair, yeah. Um, and... You know, I think I think Mike Rhodes has the. I, I'd be surprised if he wasn't at least semi-successful here, because um, he's. I mean, he's he's shown it at VCU. You know that they've they've been very successful there. So I'd say I'd say there are generally bright days ahead, but I don't know if they're going to be as bright as what Shrewsbury could have, you know, <clears throat> potentially brought to Penn. What he was bringing to Penn yeah. State at, at the in the moment. Alrighty, well, so that's all we got for that's all I got for Penn State basketball. Anything left for you to say? Uh, I do want to say good luck to Micah Shrewsbury. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Yeah, no, no hate or animosity here. Unlike unlike some people on Twitter and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, certainly wish him the best. Made the best decision for himself for his family. Uh, of course, I'll I'll still be rooting for him and for Notre Dame basketball. So I'll, I'm excited to see see what he does there. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, so now we're going to go on to the tournament as itself. And I'll tell you what, I think this has just been a fantastic tournament. Um, a lot of upsets, a lot of last second shots, crazy history, literal, not just like, I mean, there's history every year, but insane, uh, history. We have like Purdue losing to, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson, the Fairleigh Dickinson Knights FDU. That's only the second time a 16 seed has ever beaten a one seed. Um, we had Furman, uh, the Furman Paladins beating Virginia. Uh, that was a crazy play. I didn't get to watch that game, but uh, I watched the I got to watch the highlights afterwards, and that was fun. Uh, and right now we're at the Final Four with uh, we got UConn, we got the Miami Hurricanes, we got the Florida Atlantic Dunk City, and we got uh, San Diego State. Or is it? Yeah, is it San Diego State? Yeah, San Diego okay. State. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just want to know, Nisley, what have been, what's been like maybe a few of your favorite games and what are you thinking moving forward? Man, that's a good question, Brock. Like you said, it's been a absolutely crazy, super fun NCAA tournament. Oh, uh, man. My, I think my favorite game, my favorite game was probably Furman in Virginia. I was watching that one. That was really, that was just crazy to see. You know, Virginia sold right at the end and, and, you know, throwing the ball away right at midcourt. Furman hits a three with a couple seconds left to take the lead. That was insane. Yeah. Uh, there's always like three of those in the first round every year. I don't know how every, every year there's, there's something just super crazy like that. Yeah. Um, I'd say also Kansas state, Michigan state was oh, yeah. probably my next favorite. Went to overtime. 
Uh, we had a 20 and 19 game in there in, in there, 20 points, 19 assists from the Kansas State point guard. That was crazy. And that was a record, Michigan, I think, a record for assists. Yeah, I believe so, yes. And, you know, Michigan State, of course, is always a staple in the tournament. Tom Izzo is always around. They're always tough to get out. Uh, Kansas State ended up winning, I think, 98-93 in OT. So that one, that one was fun. And just an unbelievable Final Four. No one seats, uh, no one seats made the Elite Eight for the first time ever, which is absolutely insane. And we have a, uh, a four seed, two five seeds, and a nine seed in the Final Four. I didn't see that coming. My bracket, I, I had a pretty good first round, and then after that, my bracket was totally busted after the second round. So uh, no. how, how about you? Yeah, I um. That that Furman Virginia game, that's a great one. Uh, I really loved, the, and and they always deliver, which is the Gonzaga UCLA game. I got to watch that game when Gonzaga hit the three. Well, first off, they were up like ten points with like a minute to go. I was like, oh, they should be able to cruise through here. UCLA makes a big push, then Gonzaga hits that huge three, which I was like, the dude shot it from like practically the logo, like the S in March Madness logo. I thought like. Surely that's not what they drew up. Like that's not a great shot, you know. Paul, Paul George, you know that's a bad shot. But uh, they, it looks like that's how they wanted to execute it. And in the post game, they said, uh, "Yeah, we sometimes we practice that, coach. Let's let us practice that." So that was cool to see. Um, I also liked the Michigan State Kansas State game. I have a quick funny story I wanted to share about that game. So uh, the night that game was played, my friends and I were at a, a local bar, the Axeman Brewery. And we're, we're sitting there, we're playing, you know, we're playing cornhole, we're watching, you know, March Madness basketball, it's a good time, and the game's tied up, Kansas State player goes for the, you know, game winning play, he doesn't make it, hey, overtime, and then we see the TV guide pop up, and we're like, Ugh. we're like, what? And the bartender changes the channel, and so... <laughs> unbelievable me wow me and my friend and like five other five or six other random people from the bar we move to the other side of the bar to find a tv that's playing it and we watch it there and you know it was a great game and they took the lead on like the behind the back oop and the dunk that was great um yeah but my friend he goes to pay for his drink and she's like oh i didn't realize how important that game was or else i would have left it on and i guess he was like yeah why did you change it yeah. And she going was like, OT. "Yeah," and she was like, "She was like, well, the Pittsburgh Penguins game was gonna is about to be on soon, so that's why I changed it." But what happened was that when she changed the channel, the the Flyers were on. Oh, and, the Flyers suck. And the Flyers went to overtime, and then they <sighs> went to a shootout. Oh, so man. she could have, they could have just left the game on because that Flyers game went forever, and then the Flyers ended up winning in the shootout. But like. Dude, what do you do? Like we were, we're like there's this nice big TV we're watching, and all of a sudden it's this little. We had to watch on the smaller TV, like so that was kind of funny. But we still got to see the end. But dang, like what are you doing? Yeah, so somebody, you know what? Get the remote out of her hands. Get her away from the TV. You want? He, <laughs> it's this might be a reference. I hope you get Brock. Okay, okay. It should be locked in the closet yeah. with no remotes <laughs> of any kind. <laughs> How could I not get it? <laughs> That's great. Oh man. Yeah, so that was funny. I'm trying the third game I really enjoyed though. I mean, obviously like Penn State winning, that was great. I'm trying to think of one that isn't quite so biased though. Um Yeah, Furman and Virginia. I don't know, I can't think of another one. How about Gonzaga just getting killed by UConn after that as well? Oh my god. That was rough to see. How about that? That was it that was, was it was good, but also rough to see at the same time. Boy, I, UConn UConn looks good right now. Like they look they look really, really good. Um They've got Miami next, who's also been pretty good. They beat Texas in the last round, but like, dude, UConn, UConn looks like a different animal right now. And I tell you what, they play that modern style basketball: threes, layups, and dunks. That's what they do, and they're just dominating. Yeah. It's crazy when you play modern basketball; good things tend to happen whenever you're playing guys who aren't playing modern basketball. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy how that's happening. I've been listening to. Uh, you know, shout out to JJ Reddick and the Old Man in the Three podcast and uh, other related bot, um, basketball podcasts. And you know, JJ Reddick, he's talking to Steph Curry and a couple guys. These guys all agree that you you got to figure out how to shoot the three. You know, JJ Reddick recalls playing the Warriors and he says like 
They weren't doing bad. They're playing well, getting their layups, but they look up and they're down by like 12 points. And that's because Steph and Clay are just every time like three, three, three. So, I mean, love it or hate it. You know, people complain like, oh, all people want to do is shoot threes. I think, I don't think that's entirely true. Like, but you got to figure out a way, like you say, to play that modern basketball. And I just think also Gonzaga is just not a good team. Like after a big win, they are terrible in the game afterwards. Like if they have to hit a game winning shot, like they did, they just can never come down from that feeling to focus on the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's tough to come from an emotional game like that to have to play again against another really good team. Uh, A point that you, that I like that you made though, about, you know, JJ Reddick had said like, you know, at at this day and age, like you just got to figure out how to make threes. And I, I know there's, there are some people that don't like that style of play, but, Something I really like about it is that there's there's always there's always people complaining about you know how a game is is refed how it's called and you know if you're playing if you're shooting threes and you're getting layups and dunks like you're kind of taking the refs out of the game at that point like if you're a good three point shooting team it doesn't really matter what how the game is being called if you if you're making threes you're taking them completely out of the equation and then it's it's it the style of play the pace of play is just a lot better that way and i don't know i prefer it personally you know I, I like to watch teams run up and down and don't get me wrong there are there are benefits to you know playing in the post in the mid-range game and, and whatnot but it's just what like watching yukon the other night they were smooth and i mean they they absolutely dominated gonzaga they, they gave him no shot in that second half. I mean, it was unbelievable how good UConn was in that second half. Yeah, and I, I think, I think you might have even said earlier about, uh, like the San, like San Diego State. Like you, I think early you said you liked them. That's a great story going forward. That Florida, who did did Florida Atlantic? They played Kansas State. Was that yeah? They, they beat yeah. they beat Kansas State. Yes. That was that was a great game as well. I feel like I, I feel too bad like doubling down on Kansas State, but like. You know, some of the games I, I didn't get to watch every game, but I also that was also a great game too. And yes, San Diego State Creighton was a good one. Miami and Texas was a good. There, there were there's been a lot of good games. Yeah, the NCAA tournament always delivers, it unlike delivered. the college football playoff. <laughs> that does not often deliver, but the NCAA, NCAA tournament always does. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I was wondering, do you have any predictions going forward for who do you think's gonna? you know, playing the championship and maybe even who will win the championship. Oh man, that's a good question, Brock. You know, I mean, UConn's got the hot hand right now. I mean, UConn, UConn and Miami are definitely the two favorites, at least in my opinion, to, to, it's likely one of those two teams ends up on top. Um, I'm taking UConn over Miami right now. San Diego State, Florida Atlantic's interesting. Um, San Diego State's got a lot of good size. They've got, a lot of their, a lot of like fifth year seniors because of the, the COVID year and whatnot, the super seniors, they call them. And, but FAU's just been survive in advance every round. They That's haven't true. even played particularly great in some of these games. They just find a way. Historically speaking, um, a team like FAU that does get to the final four doesn't usually get to the championship game. And so if history is going to repeat itself, I'm probably going to take San Diego State over Florida Atlantic. And then that, that would give me my uh, UConn and San Diego State in the championship. UConn's just, they're just different right now. Yeah. So I've, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling with UConn. I'm rolling with the Huskies, baby, <laughs> to, uh, to go all the way. Yeah, I feel, I feel bad. Like, I, I was thinking a similar thing. Like, I think UConn looks good right now. I just, I'm like, man, how could I... Like I, I, me and a lot of other people have just been doubting Miami. Like every time they just look good, they keep moving forward. I, I, here we are again, yeah. and I'm like, ah, oh, UConn looks pretty good. And like, <laughs> I mean, how can like Miami has just been playing really well. Mm-hmm. So I think I, every every game Miami's played, I'm like, I think I'm gonna go against Miami, and they just keep finding a way to win. So yeah. maybe maybe I'm just secretly me going against Miami every time is is just the luck they they're they're listening to me. It's, they're yeah. like, oh. Hunter guy doesn't believe in us. They don't. They don't believe in the U, baby. In the U, yeah. He's, they're keeping their receipts. <laughs> um, 
And we could get Florida Atlantic wins and Miami wins. We get the Florida championship. That would be crazy. If that happens, that's insane. Um, I'm, I'm going to go, I mean, I really want to pick UConn, but I feel like I have to, I have to give in. I'm going to go with Miami to get to the championship. This is, uh, this is what Miami's second year in the final four. Or at least first it, time ever. Or, or their first time. I think they. I think they went to the Elite Eight mm-hmm. two times in a row. So this is their first time ever. I feel like. I feel like what better time to get to the championship than now? You know, I think that's mm-hmm. going to be uh, Jim's message to his team. Like, don't don't think that this could just happen again. So, man, yeah. UConn looks so good though. But I'm going to pick Miami against my yeah. better against my better thoughts, and. But I'm gonna stick with you. I think San Diego State, like, that's another you team. Think they roll. Yeah, yeah. I think they win. I, I mean, I guess they're all teams. Like, never did we ever imagine something like this would happen. So they're all yeah. kind of like that's that adds a nice layer to it, where it's not a team that's used to being here. There's a lot of teams that are not quite as experienced as playing this long, getting this far, and that's uh, added a really nice element to uh, this Final Four. Absolutely. Parody in college basketball. Parody in anything is usually pretty fun, so I'm happy that we're seeing it here in college hoops. Yeah, so I'm gonna. Man, there's things like man, I can't imagine like Miami winning the touch the whole thing. I know it, it doesn't sound right. That's yeah. why I went with UConn. <laughs> yeah, UConn. That sounds a bit better, but then it's like, man, imagine like Florida Atlantic. Like if you told someone, like Florida Atlantic would have a chance to win the March Madness, they'd probably be like. What are you talking about? But yep. uh, I don't know. I think I think Miami. I think I've I've never gotten a pick wrong on this podcast, as we usually say, you know. So I'm feeling I'm gonna I'm gonna just give in. I'm gonna roll with Miami. I roll. Well, hey, if one of us has to get a pick wrong. We're both undefeated. For, yeah. Forever. <laughs> we got to so break one, the tie. One of us. One of us is gonna break the tie. Yeah. <laughs> Officially. All right. Well, that's uh. That's about all I got for the tournament right now. Anything else you wanted to add, Nisley? No. Hey, let's go Huskies. They're going to take down the U, baby. They're going to take down the U. <laughs> and no, NCAA tournament's fun. Shout out Rutgers basketball. You didn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, not too upset about it, if I'm being honest. Man, that that is – I'm glad you brought that up, man. It's like Rutgers doesn't make it. They have this big chip <laughs> on their shoulder, and then they lose – I, I I kind of wish I had watched it. Probably probably one of the best N- NIT games ever played in the history of the NIT. Yeah. But uh, they lose in that first round in overtime. It's a tough yeah, way to end the season. To? I forget. Oh, that's that's an incredible question. It's not a for me. It was it not was a, a very well known H- Hofstra. It was yeah. It was Hofstra. Man, that's I can't right. believe I remember that. Hofstra. Man. I think yeah. Hofstra's in New York. I, have, I had a friend who went to Hofstra, so he was excited about it. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Roll, roll Hofstra, baby. Any, <laughs> any, anything anything to, to take down Rutgers basketball. So we'll be moving on here to our final topic, which was the World Baseball Classic. And, uh, Nisley, did you watch the World Baseball Classic? I did. I watched, uh, I watched a fair amount of the World Baseball Classic, and I had a really good time doing that. Uh, how about you? Did, you? did you get a chance to watch any? I'm going to be honest. I didn't watch a single second of the World Baseball Classic, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest again. I I regret not watching it because it seemed like a record. Not seemed like it was a record uh, night for baseball. Well, a couple of nights for baseball, as well as a great atmosphere. And I'll be honest, I didn't. I saw some stuff on Instagram. Did not have it on my television once, and I I I think in the end I'm the loser for having not watched it. <laughs> You know, Brock, I have to agree with your assessment of yourself um, that you are are the loser for not watching the World Baseball Classic. Uh, it was a ton of fun to uh, just watch just the, the the emotion and the passion of it. Like you could tell how much this meant to to everybody that was there, you know, whether it was the United States or Japan or Puerto Rico or Mexico, like all these teams, the Czech Republic, uh, like they were all just so excited to be there and uh you know mlb should be able to take some notes on this you know allow there to be passion in major league baseball somebody hits a bomb like let the team leave the dugout meet him at home plate yeah. for anything that's not a walk-off home run like <laughs> it doesn't have to be the most boring and like 
conservative celebration you've ever seen in your life after like a three run home run in the seventh. Like hello, they they barely let him get away with like a fist pump around the bases or something in the MLB. Like, dude, these guys were going crazy after a single down seven nothing. They yeah. were getting pumped. Yeah. It was it was so much fun to see. And just to see that there's so much talent around the world in, in baseball too, especially uh, you know, of course the United States is very good. Japan ended up winning. They beat the United States in the in the final. Um, the Dominican Republic was the favorite to win and they didn't even make the 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 bracket after the round robin. So and of course Cuba's there and Mexico was awesome. Canada's decent. Like there's there's talent just super spread out. And it's it's really fun to see uh, just how global baseball really is. Yeah, that was uh, seemed like a lot of great atmosphere for those games. Definitely down the stretch, uh, from what I heard. Again, from what I've heard, there is a great atmosphere, um, and that's cool to get a win for it, it. A lot of places are saying, and I agree with this idea that like baseball kind of got a win before the season even started. Mm. So. And I agree to like take some notes, like try to get that energy into the regular season. Cause now, like, maybe if someone doesn't watch baseball regularly and they happen to watch the baseball classic, they're like, oh, maybe baseball's cool. And then they're going to turn on the MLB. And like you said, like, not as much celebrating, not as much life to the game. That is if, you know, it's on TV ever. Um, yeah, it's true. <laughs> one thing I have to say, I think is really cool is that it was, you know, Mike Trout and Otani facing each other. And that's pretty cool. But, and, and that, uh, I saw a stat, I can't remember the exact words of it, but like Otani getting Mike Trout to strike out swinging is like, that does not happen often for Mike Trout. So Mm -hmm. that's crazy. What I've learned from this tournament, my biggest takeaway was destroy the angels of Anaheim, get rid of that (laughs) franchise. Okay. Like. You cannot have, you know, there's all these great memes like, oh, imagine if Otani and Mike Trout were on the same team. (laughs) Like, dude, they're on the same team and the Angels have done nothing. Like, get them out of there. Mm -hmm. Like, don't let this be Shohei Otani's. Like, it's a great moment. And I think he should be proud of it. Everyone should be proud and happy about it. But don't let this be the best moment of his career. Which, again, it's not a bad moment, but he deserves so much better. Absolutely. You know what? Let's transition to just shitting on the Angels right now because they, <laughs> they deserve all of it. They have Sho- Shohei Otani, who, and I don't think this is, like, I think this is pretty much confirmed. He is the best baseball player to ever live, I think. I think it's already set in stone. He is by far the most talented baseball player ever. The dude's like a top five hitter and a top five pitcher at the same time. Like, that's unreal. The angel, the angels got him right now. They've, they've got, they've got the man. They've had Mike Trout for a decade, and he's been the face of baseball for a decade. He's been the best hitter for a decade. He's been the best player for a decade, at least until Shohei got there. And they made the playoffs once with Mike Trout beforehand, and I think it was a wild card game, if I remember correctly, which they lost. So they played one career playoff game with Mike Trout, and they get Shohei. And their season just absolutely fell apart last year. And they show he had a good year. Trout had a pretty decent year when he played. And they just have nothing to show for it. And, you know, I wouldn't say things have to go really well for them to make it this year to make the playoffs. And if they don't make it this year, no way in hell Shohei hangs around L.A. to or at least to stay with the Angels. Like, may, may hang around L.A., go, to the, go over to the Dodgers, but, like, it's just so disappointing to have two of the best baseball talents in the history of the game. Like this is like putting LeBron and Kobe on the same team and then being like, ah, sorry guys, we can't make the playoffs. It's unfortunate, but we just can't do it. Yeah. It's so disappointing. Yeah. And just like one playoff game, like it, the nobody knows, I shouldn't say nobody, but I have a feeling that if you ask a random person on the street, or, or let's just say a random sports fan, like a casual, just for the sake of the argument. If you ask the casual sports fan, hey, who's the best NFL player? They're probably going to say Patrick Mahomes. They're probably going to say, uh, well, they would have said Tom Brady, and you know, Tom Brady just retired. Like, 
there, there's names, right? They know the, the, those are some fair choices. If you say who's the best player in the NBA, they're going to say LeBron. They're going to say Steph Curry. You know, they might even say like, well, he's been out for a bit, but like you know, Kawhi Leonard, you know, Kevin Durant. People, people know who that is. But I feel like if you ask the average person who's the best MLB player, I don't think many people know who Mike Trout is because he's only played in one playoff game. He's in you know, the. No one's no one's going to the Angels games. Like they aren't a relevant team. Only they're only relevant when they do something bad, which is every day during the season. You know, like yeah. when they intentionally walked someone, and it the bases were full, so they intentionally walked in a run. And you just can't like you just can't have that. Like as a league, you just can't have that. And I uh, I've watched a lot of um, now it's a different league, but I think it's still relevant. I you know Damian Lillard of the Portland Trails Blazers has been very vocal about how, you know, he wants to play in Portland. He likes playing in Portland, you know, just because somebody, you know, just because you leave to another team doesn't mean you automatically win a championship. You know, everybody thought Russell Westbrook leaving a team would be great. Now he's not doing as well as he was before. And I think the difference here is like people are showing up to Portland Trail Blazers games. People know who Damian Lillard is. You know, I think again, like who's, who's, who are some good players? Like I think, the average fan would probably say, hey, that Damian Lillard guy is pretty good. Whereas, like, the Angels, it's like, no one's going to those dang games. Like, the tickets are cheap. It's, like, it's a bad venue. I just think, get rid of that franchise and get Mike Trout and Shohei Atani out of there or, or figure it out. Yeah. Spend all the money you have to get something right. I just, exactly. you cannot, like, after this, the Angels look bad, I think. That's one of my, that's my biggest Ab- takeaway. Absolutely, absolutely. You know what? We should just get rid of, get rid of the Angels. Let's just send Shohei and Mike Trout. Let's send them to Pittsburgh, to the best baseball city in, in oh, the United no. States. Oh, <laughs> no. To the Pittsburgh Pirates, you know. <laughs> Listen, the, the, Pir- the Pirates are looking good. They've got Key Brian Hayes and O'Neill Cruz. You know, well, let's say we add Shohei and Mike Trout. <laughs> and they're they're gonna win 120 games. They're gonna just they're gonna dominate the bigs. You got what the big you, you got the big three: Shohei Otani, Mike Trout, and Andrew McCutcheon in the Steel City. <laughs> Andrew baby. McCutcheon, yes, uh, sir. I probably wouldn't send them to Pittsburgh, but somewhere else, something better. And and you know I do. Uh, the reason I brought up the fans thing was because I do appreciate when you know Mike Trout loves the fan base, wants to play there. But I I just think like after this man like. You deserve so much better than just playing these crummy games of baseball for nothing for a crummy organization. So. Absolutely, I I agree hundred percent. It it's, sucks for Trout and it sucks because it, it's not like Trout hasn't performed. Like he's done everything in his power to uh, to become one of the best baseball players to ever live, and the Angels just have nothing to show for it. Yeah, and but it also shows like Otani better be swimming. And MVPs, like, at like MVP trophies, you know, and people are like, "Oh, what are we gonna give it to him every year?" Yeah, if he keeps doing this, he should. Like, yeah, those are unbelievable he's, numbers. Yeah, I mean, he's by far the most. If you're just talking in terms of true value, he's by far the most valuable player to ever play baseball. Like, like people thought Babe Ruth was good. Like, no, no this. You, you put this guy next to Babe Ruth in that era, and Shohei's probably going to hit like 140 home runs in one season <laughs> and not give up a run because they've never seen a ball go faster than 90 miles an hour in their life. Yeah, he's, throwing, he's throwing 96-mile-an-hour sinkers, dude. It's just gross. And they're drinking and smoking in the dugout, you know, so they're <laughs> not the best athletes. Uh, just figure it out, Angels. Do exactly. something right. Help out Mike Trout and Shohei something. Um, exactly. Hey, I do want to give a shout out quick okay. to the Czech, to the Czech Republic baseball team that was in the World Baseball Classic. Um, I was on TikTok right before the classic started, and I was just scrolling through, and I came across this random video. This guy was talking about being like a gym teacher and whatnot. I wasn't paying like too close attention to it, and and then he was like, "Yeah, I'm a gym teacher, blah blah blah, and I'm the starting center fielder for the Czech Republic." <laughs> <laughs> And then the next guy's like, yeah, I work at a bank and I'm the starting third baseman for the Czech Republic. Wow. And like, they're all just like normal people. And they came in and they, they won one game. They beat China, which was really cool. Uh, so shout out Czech Republic for, for showing up, for balling out and looking <laughs> really good. 
representing well at the World Baseball Classic. All right, now the World Baseball Classic. This happens every three years, correct? I think it's every four. Whatever it is. Um, Something. Every every handful of years. Every handful of years. Every X amount of number of years. Um, do you think with this loss, um, do you think they, that um, the USA tries to make a Dream Team-esque push f- for the championship? Like, do you, do you think this is that wake-up call, like, this is supposed to be what we're good at? Like, we, the, like we really got to go hard into the World Baseball Classic. What do you think about that? I think uh, it wouldn't surprise me because they have the they got the position players there. Like Trout was there, Goldschmidt was there, Real Muto was there. Um, they got a lot of a lot of good position players. Really, where they lacked was they couldn't get any of their big name pitchers to come over. Like they couldn't get Jacob Degrom, or they couldn't get Garrett Cole, and they couldn't get like like Zach Wheeler or Aaron Nola or any of those guys to to come play for them. Uh, a lot of it's citing like just the the build up that they have in spring training, like their arms aren't fully ready to go, which I understand. But at the same time, like I, I hopefully just with how much hype was around the WBC this year and seeing how successful it was, especially for some of these other countries. Oh um, yeah. Like I, I'm really hoping next time around, like we, we're we're sending a few more dudes. You know, we're we're sending we're sending like three to five to seven of our best arms instead of like our like the 150th best starting pitcher in baseball or something you know like yeah hopefully hopefully we can at least get a better pitching staff over there next time yeah and hopefully maybe like guys can come back and say man that was you know it was so much fun to play in the world baseball classic and you know they can see the fun that the players are had like you said and hopefully that can convince a few more people to like lighten up a bit or let their guard down a little bit, go over and have some fun in the World Baseball Absolutely. Classic. Yeah, and no disrespect to the Adam Wainwrights of the world or the Lance Lynns of the world, but I would I would prefer to have maybe somebody a little better <laughs> to pitch in the biggest games. You know, Merrill Kelly started <laughs> the, uh, wow. the World Baseball Classic final, and like no disrespect to Merrill Kelly, great pitcher, seems like a great guy. Had him on my fantasy team for a little bit last year. Like, I would prefer for somebody else to start the World Baseball Classic final if I'm the United States. No, definitely. What a great moment for him, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shout out to him. I mean, that's that's like an unbelievable moment to be able to start in the WBC final against Japan. Like, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, so good for the WBC. Maybe in three or four years, I'll actually tune in this time. Uh, you have plenty of time to prepare. Next yeah, time. Um, I actually didn't like. I didn't know it was a thing, or like I forgot it was a thing, like that they did it however many years. So that's good that it got a win. Looks like there's some more buzz around it now. So hey, we'll see you in however many years it's going to be until there's another one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, all right, and Isaiah, I th- think that's just about everything I had for this episode. Was there anything else you wanted to add? No, shout out Rutgers basketball. Shout out UConn <laughs> basketball. Uh, excited for the Final Four. Excited for, for Mike Rhodes at Penn State. Excited for baseball season. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, look for. I hope everyone has a good Final Four. Look forward to the Final Four in the championship game. Hopefully that's a one to remember. And uh, hey, everyone, thanks for watching. This has been the Sports Lovers Podcast. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace.